Our first order of business today is a public meeting under the Retail Business Holiday Act, so I'll, I'll call this public meeting to order. <coughs> and roll call. All members are present except Mayor Crombie, Councillor... Oh, they're there. The other two. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, <coughs> this public meeting is being held pursuant to the Retail Business Holiday Act to consider an application for exemption for an individual retail establishment under the Act by PAT Oriental Food Market located at Unit 315, 333 Dundas Street East in the City of Mississauga. If approved, PAT Oriental Food Market shall be exempt from the provisions of the Act to the limited extent that it shall be permitted to remain open voluntarily between 9 a.m. and 10 p.m. on New Year's Day, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, Victoria Day, Canada Day, Labor Day, and Thanksgiving Day. Peel Region is the approval authority for applications for exemption under the Retail Business Holidays Act. Regional staff will report back to Regional Council regarding the PAT Oriental Food Market application, including outcomes of the public meeting. A regional bylaw is required for approval and will be presented at a future meeting of Regional Council. I would like to remind Council of the provincial mandate that retail business holidays should be maintained as common pause days for consumers and employees. Exemptions may be granted where the provincial tourism criteria found in Ontario Regulation 711-91 have been met. I note that even where the tourism criteria are met, Council is not required to pass an exemption bylaw. If an exemption is granted, any person who objects to the bylaw may appeal Council's decision to the Ontario Municipal Board no later than 30 days after the day the bylaw is passed by Council. In accordance with Section 4 of the Retail Business Holidays Act, a bylaw that is passed under this section and is not appealed will come into force on the 31st day after it is passed by Council. The format for this morning's meeting will include a short presentation by staff, representations by the public, including the PAT Oriental Food Market applicant, to explain how the application meets the provincial tourism criteria. Following the presentation, there will be an opportunity for the public to make written and or verbal submissions on the matter or ask questions of the applicants or regional staff. There is a sign-in sheet located at the clerk's reception counter for anyone who wishes to make submissions. There is a separate sheet for anyone who wishes to be notified of Council's decision on this application. If you are speaking on behalf of a special interest group, I ask that you please identify the group prior to speaking. I will ask the regional clerk to advise of the method by which notice of the meeting was given and confirm the dates that the notices were given. Thank you. Notice of this public meeting to consider an application for exemption by PAT Oriental Food Market was given in accordance with Region of Peel Bylaw 18-1999, sections 11-2C to 11-2F by first class mail to every person in agency that has given the regional clerk a written request of such notice of the proposed bylaw, the clerk of each local municipality within the region of Peel, to the policing authority having jurisdiction in the area, and to the applicant on March 7, 2017. The applicant was instructed to post the notice of public meeting in the retail establishment seeking exemption no later than March 24, 2017, and for it to remain there until the end of the business day today. Further, notice of this public meeting was given in accordance with Section 4 of the Act and Region of Peel Bylaw 18-1999 by publication in the following news media having general circulation in the Region of Peel. Mississauga News, March 9, 2017. Brampton Guardian, March 9, 2017. Caledon Enterprise, March 9, 2017. In addition, the notice of public meeting was posted on the region's website as of March 6, 2017. Any person who would like further notice of the further future passage of the PAT Oriental Food Markets application for exemption to the Act should give their full name, address, postal code and telephone number in writing at the clerk's reception counter prior to leaving this meeting. 
Uh, we will now consider the application by PAT Oriental Food Market. Regional staff will provide an overview of the subject application. I request all persons wishing to address the application to ask questions to address the chair. Uh, I'll call now on uh, Christina Marzo, Manager, Development Services, Public Works, to discuss an application for an area basis tourism exemption under the Retail Business Holiday Act by PAT Oriental Food Market in the City of Mississauga. Welcome, Christina. Good morning, Chair Dell, members of Regional Council, and those from the community who are joining us today. I'm Christina Marzo, Manager of Development Services here at the Region of Peel, and have been reviewing and working with the applicant to uh, process this application. I'm here this morning to provide a brief presentation on the Retail Business Holidays Act exemption request by PAT Oriental Food Market. And the applicant is also here with their consultant to present to you today and provide more details and rationale for their application. I provided here an aerial map of the exemption area. It is located on 3315 and 333 Dundas Street East and is roughly about three major blocks east of here Ontario Street. I just wanted to review the process we undertook to review this application. Um, it is being reviewed under the current existing in effect policies and regulations of the Retail Business Holidays Act and Regional Bylaw 18, 1999. Um, you will recall that a report was brought forth to Regional Council um, on informing Regional Council of a section 1.2 of the Retail Business Holiday Act that had been proclaimed on December 31st, 2016. Uh, this slide and, and what I wanted to inform you of today is that um, the review of this application is not affected by this proclamation, um, mainly because we Regional Council has not yet taken action on enacting any of the um, regime that is allowed to us through Section 1.2 of the Retail Business Holidays Act. Um, in summary, Section 1.2 would allow a municipality to pass a bylaw which states that um, the Retail Business Holidays Act no longer applies to the municipality after it establishes its own retail closure bylaw. Um, review of Section 1.2 is undergoing by regional staff. Um, its impact and any future action Regional Council wishes to take uh, will be reviewed and brought forth by Regional staff at a future date. Through the Retail Business Holidays Act, the exemption criteria outlines um, that the exemption would need to assist in the maintenance or development of tourism and it would have to meet the criteria outlined in the Act and accompanying Ontario Regulation 711 slash 91. The applicant has submitted a study with their application that illustrated how they met these exemption criteria and how the establishment would contribute to the tourism within the city of Mississauga. Just a reminder, the Retail Business Holiday Act also outlines the provincial tourism criteria by which the exemption is based on. The retail business establishment may be exempt if it's located within two kilometers of a tourist attraction and is directly associated with a tourist attraction or relies on tourists visiting the attraction for business on a holiday. By definition, the tourist location, uh, a tourist location can be a natural, historical, cultural, educational, or outdoor recreational attraction. Um, and this location, this establishment is uh, within two kilometers of the Mississauga Chinese Center um, and a number of parks in the area where active programs are um, scheduled. And it's actually just over the two, two kilometers from Square One Shopping Center and Celebration Square in Mississauga. Um, our next steps on this application is documenting input from this public meeting 
um, I will report back to Regional Council with a report for recommendation at a future date. A bylaw will also be prepared at this time for Regional Council consideration. Um, the adoption of the bylaw is required for approval, and any person who objects to bylaw may do so within 30 days to the Ontario Municipal Board. And uh, just a reminder that any bylaw that is not appealed will come into effect on the 31st day after it's been passed by council. Sorry, that concludes my presentation. I'm not, if there's any questions, I'm willing to take them. Sorry, Councillor Kovac, please. Thank you, and through you, Chair Dale, just wanted uh, to ask a question yeah. uh, for clarity. On page five of item 4.1, a retail business establishment may be exempt if it is located within two kilometers of a tourist attraction. Would the entity then become, a, in effect, a tourist attraction, thus extending the kilometer radius? Not necessarily. Um, my understanding of that section states that it could itself become mm -hmm. a tourist um, establishment or it'll be contributing to the tourist activity that occurs in the area based on um, pre-existing tourist attractions within that two kilometer radius. So it wouldn't radius. necessarily grow that radius? Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Yanika. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, thank you. First of all, um, I appreciate Councillor Kovacs asking for that clarification. I think it's on a fundamental point. I, I want to commend staff because this applicant in my ward has kudos for staff and how professionally they've been dealt with. So I wanted to thank you for that. And I just, um, in terms of the two kilometer radius, um, the argument that I would make, and I know my friend Councillor Starr's made it and others, you call it a two kilometer radius. I call it a cluster because what's happening is I have a lot of businesses, whether they're along Highway 10 or the emerging Dundas Street that say, you've got the Mississauga Chinese Centre beside me, it is within two kilometres, you've got square one, you've given it to them. To the west, Ron Starr knows that at Central Parkway in Burnhamthorpe, we've got a huge cluster. This one refers to itself as an oriental, I'll call it. They're saying, we're part of that cluster and they're driving by us to get to those. So with respect, you call it two kilometres, I'm calling it a cluster and they're arguing, we're part of that cluster and I tend to agree with them. but. It is two kilometers, I acknowledge right. that, but you can see the arguments being brought forward and why I think they would make sense. And the legislation, such as it is, allows it, and I don't think they're anxious to change it, so they want to drop it off on us. Businesses want to compete. I think under the cluster argument, we should have more of these to be fair to all the other businesses, and I think the legislation allows it under what you call that two-kilometer scenario. That's all that I would add, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and thank you to you and your staff, because the applicant went out of their way to say how marvelous you were, folks were to deal with. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Councillor Stark. Yeah, just a quick question and clarification of the of the powers that we're going to have. Some, what, what's the status of uh, the what the province is doing? Uh, Section 1.2 has been proclaimed, so it is in effect. Um, but now the responsibility lies on the municipalities and us as regional council to um, bring forth a bylaw that would state the Retail Business Holidays Act no longer applies to the region. But in turn, we cannot do that until we establish our own retail closure bylaw for the region of Peel. Um, that ha noth nothing has been begun on that front, and I know um, corporate services staff is working on a report to review the implications and impact of Section 1.2 to our retail closures in Peel, and will bring forth um, information and research and potential recommendations to how we move forward with that. I don't know if um well, uh, what I'm getting at is because I know there are other applications in the wings and I and I probably along with Council Unica I mean I've told them to hold off I mean the, the costs yeah. are atrocious to get to this stage and I don't think it's fair to these uh, uh, well currently with store without, owners yeah without um, any changes to our procedures and, and bylaw to process exemption applications we are just processing them as currently stated in our regional bylaw and the act. Uh, so we're sort of moving forward as as we have in the past. Uh, and until we bring forth any changes to that process, um, we won't be changing that for now. If we bring forward any um, changes to our regional bylaw and processing that, we'll adopt those changes or any future changes based on the information in section 1.2 of the Retail Business Holidays Act. I'm not sure what I heard. So you're not changing anything? At this point, nothing has been changed. So what we are doing is operating under the current 
requirements and regulations of the Act and our regional bylaws. Uh, I'm going to ask the processes. I'm going to ask the commissioner to respond if, for some yes, clarity, if I, please. If I could, through the chair. Our proposal is to come forward to Regional Council in June with a report on an approach to develop a new bylaw for the region of Peel. It does take, take some time to develop a new bylaw and often involves public consultation. Um, for your information, the City of Toronto ha has had this ability for 10 years and has not yet created their own bylaw. It has, and they, they have conducted many consultations uh, with the public. Uh, so it does take time. We're not pro proposing to take that long. We will come forward w with a proposed approach in June for Council's consideration uh, and for your input. Um, our proposal would be obviously a shorter term consultation and presentation of options and a bylaw to Council sh shortly on the heels of that June report. Well, I, I'm happy that's happening. I, ju I just think it's... Uh this whole <clears throat> notion of tourist uh, attractions to be become a supermarket or uh, any other uh, way of selling wares is crazy and the faster we do it the better uh, I mean I've, I've, I've been involved now in three and when I see the costs and when they show me the billings and when they show me the lawyers and all the rest of it uh, it's to me it's not fair uh, and especially when when these are competing against every other supermarket that's legally entitled to be open and why why is it you know i just that's my rant but i mean i just think we should push it as fast as possible <clears throat> Thank you. Councillor Yanika. Thank you, and I really appreciate Ron's point. Uh, speaking only to the point, not the application. And Ron, then they approached the local councillor in days gone by, what would you like us to do? And I said, well, we may have new legislation. We'll see. A year goes by, another year goes by. Their competitors have their customers drive right by their shop. Say, what would you like us to do? So it really puts them in a cumbersome situation. Then through our research, we found out, oh, Toronto could deal with it. What have they done? They've waited 10 years. It's a mess. So folks like this either have to close down or they have to compete, so they spent the money. Then, then we're telling them, but in June we may bring new legislation. They go, so are we doing all of this for nothing? I'm saying, I really don't know. He goes, but we can't stand in limbo and have our competitors have those dozen more. Ron, you're absolutely bang on, which is why I'm of a mind. If you feed the criteria, go ahead, let them compete fairly. The province doesn't want to fix it. They're expecting us to do it. It could be another 10 years. These folks got to get on with their businesses on a fair footing. So I see more of these coming forward, and I think appropriately we should be approving all of them that fit the criteria. But you're, you're bang on in terms of where it leaves merchants trying to create jobs, pay taxes, employ folks, et cetera. It's, it's not a good situation. Thank you. Um, Councillor Sato. Thank you. I think I said at um, a previous meeting that sometimes setting a precedent isn't a bad thing. Sometimes it's a good thing. But in this case, I think setting a precedent could be a bad thing. Um, I, I don't support wide open um, on the statutory holidays. And my residents don't support it by and large. We, we've done several surveys, I've done several surveys, and when it's come up, um, there's a tremendous amount, of, and that's why Toronto has not passed the bylaw, because the public input is not in favor of wide open. The problem with this is, it's not tourism. Um, you know, when you look at some of perhaps the larger um, specialty markets, that are really close to places like Celebration Square, which is our tourism site, and particularly with the, the Chinese Centre. Those are different because they can pass under tourism. This one, and I'm not centering this one, it just happens to be the one we're dealing with today, and other um, others that will come forward and have come forward are a business. They're grocery stores. They're a business. So if you grant it, you know, without following the, the criteria that we are working under today, you can't jump ahead and assume that regional council is going to pass a different bylaw and that in three, four, five, six months there will be different criteria because it might not be. Four or five months we might still have exactly the same criteria or something a little bit different but not wide open, carte blanche, everybody can open whenever they want to. Um, public opinion might might tell us differently as it has done in the City of Toronto. So I think we do need to look at this under the existing criteria, Councillor Unica, with all due respect. I know that 
you have had other um, other situations in your ward, and some of those I have supported because they they do fall under what could be termed as tourism. But you know, you, you, because we've allowed one that meets the criteria does not mean that we should just be rubber stamping every other small one that comes forward that perhaps does not meet the exact criteria of tourism. And, you know, sometimes, like, you know, that's business. Councillor Starr said about all the money they're spending. That's business. You know, if, if you want an exemption to a bylaw, then you have to be prepared to spend the money for the fees and whatever else to get that exemption. And the way the law or bylaw is today, that's what is required. So, you know, you, you don't just change it on the fly to suit one particular business. What will happen, we know what will happen if, um, if we open the door, is every Loblaws, every super center, every metro, every, every large supermarket will be coming forward and saying, me, 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 and then you've got wide open, which um, I'm not really quite sure that that's what the public has um, has a taste for I, at this point I, in time. I certainly appreciate the comments made by all councillors today, but it's not truly the purpose of this meeting, so. and it, it really is for a debate when, when it comes back, uh, but I, I've given you that liberty. Um, any further questions for clarification? If none, then we move this into the public participation. Thanks, Christina. Yeah. Uh, today we have received a request from the applicant to make an oral submission and we have received no other request to speak today about the application for exemption under oh sorry the, yeah I'm sorry uh, we, we have sorry we have received uh, an oral submission by Jay Sung Lee manager PAT Oriental Food Market and Alex uh, Avarifisan Partner Interstrategics or Stratix Consultants Inc. presenting the Pat Oriental Food Market application for tourism exemption under the Retail Business Act. Um, I will now call on the representatives of PAT Oriental Food Market to explain how the application meets the provincial tourism criteria. Welcome, and if you'd be kind enough just to introduce yourselves. Hi, um, I'd like to introduce myself as uh, Jay, I'm the manager at uh, PAT Oriental uh, Food Market. And uh, I'd also like to introduce uh, Alex, uh, who is our consultant uh, that helped us to prepare this report and, um, and do a study on this uh, to, to get this permit. Uh, I'd also like to introduce uh, my, my dad, who is the owner of the business. Uh, he's not uh, here right now, but I'd just like to introduce you to him nonetheless. <coughs> Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, Nando for, for being here uh, with us uh, for the Region Appeal um, <coughs> Councillor. And I just uh, want to say thank you for your input on this matter. And um, um, I'd like to first start off with an over overview of uh, PAT Oriental Food Market, uh, where we could also go by uh, Pat Supermarket or uh, PAT Mart. And, uh, so basically, uh, we're a family-run business, and, or we started off as a family-run business and currently are, and we're located in the region of Peel, and uh, our main intersection is on Dundas and uh, here, Ontario, and we're basically a Korean, uh, we're, we're basically a grocery store that specializes in Korean and Japanese goods, and uh, right now we're currently under a, uh, an, ex an expansion so that we're trying to get our store bigger to accommodate more products and uh, and um, more customers. So I'll give you just a brief overview of our our, our supermarket. We are uh, we've been in business since 1984, and um, it, it started off as a very small family-run business and the size of a convenience store. And eventually, we expanded out and got bigger. And there was. Um, what was formerly known as White Rose, we eventually moved to that location and we expanded further um, to accommodate the, uh, the customers and also to make more room for, for the goods and services that we can provide. So uh, right now we are currently even expanding further to, to 
to uh, grow our business. And uh, another thing is uh, I'd like to also uh, talk about the uniqueness of our business. Um, we're basically, um, the, way I, the, the way it is is that we're a major hub for the Korean community, um, meaning that a lot of the Korean uh, community we support. We, we do a lot of um, activities as well as classes uh, for, the, for, our, for the Korean culture. Uh, to support the community, but not only for Koreans, but also uh, non-Koreans, because I know that Korean food is becoming more popular now, and um, there's, there are more people that are non-Korean that are very much interested in our, our food. Another uh, uniqueness is that we are, um, we're basically uh, the largest supermarket in the region of Peel. Uh, but not only in the region in, um Korean. Oh, sorry, yeah, largest Korean supermarket in the region of Peel. But um, not only for the region of Peel, but also extending outwards. There are a lot more uh, people come all the way, actually, because uh, there's no big Korean supermarket, uh, you know, extending out all the way to as far as Buffalo and, and Detroit. And uh, we've actually had, uh, I've actually talked to a lot of customers who come all the way even from Buffalo just to, uh, on the weekends, to, to purchase Korean groceries. And um, so I think this is a good opportunity for, you know, the people, they're able to, to, to come to our store from, from far away. And um, yeah, so that's basically in a nutshell what, um, what this, that's basically a nutshell of our business. And um, I'd also, like to say the reason why we're here is to basically get a permit so that we're able to open on stat holidays and um, provide services as well as activities and and classes for for people and uh, I'd like to now pass this on over to Alex all right thank, thank you, you. <clears throat> uh, good morning uh, my name is Alex Arafuzaman, and I'm a partner at Interstratix Consultants. And um, over the past seven years, we've done uh, several of these applications uh, for holiday openings. And every time we do a market study, uh, we review the customer base and the location of uh, the, the uh, retailer to ensure that it complies uh, with the regulations under the uh, Retail Business and Holidays Act. And um, none of these have been big chain retailers uh, uh, with respect to just uh, overall uh, grocery stores. Uh, we look at each one individually. And in this case, uh, after we reviewed it, I think the biggest takeaway that, uh, that really I learned uh, from analyzing the customers is that this is the uh, largest uh, uh, Korean um, hub for uh, food and other services um, in between Windsor and all of southwestern Ontario and the greater Toronto area. So any, uh, I guess, uh, people in that area that want to shop uh, for this type of product, uh, the closest and most convenient one would be um, PAT, Oriental Food Market, and um, that is something that, that enhances and develops tourism in addition to the other criteria which will uh, quickly go through. Um, so the application seeks an exemption for these days. Uh, notably uh, not included would be uh, Christmas Day and Family Day, which is consistent with um, work we have done in the past uh, and in terms of what the uh, public uh, uh, has, has uh, what we have done with respect to this. Pros proposed hours are 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, here's the site, and if you just notice, there's uh, there's another building to the uh, left, which is uh, currently uh, being combined. Uh, PAT has recently uh, expanded, or is in the process of expanding. And um, in addition to uh, the the grocery business, there are approximately 20 small stalls and uh, offices with, within the site, 
which cater to uh, services uh, for the Korean and the greater community uh, in terms of uh, uh, things like hairdresser. Um, there's there's meeting space for classes, music classes. There's other types of products that are sold there, such as electronics, etc. So um, it's it's beyond a supermarket. It's more of a Korean cultural hub, as, as how I would put it. This is a rendering of what it, uh, the site will look like uh, when the expansion is complete. Uh, here is the, uh, the map with a two-kilometer radius. Uh, Mississauga Chinese Center is definitely within it. Square One Shopping Center is just at the extreme edge of that two-kilometer radius span. Here's some renderings of the inside of the supermarket area. So uh, th these are the criteria that are required uh, under the uh, Retail Business Holidays Act. And uh, um, basically, it's within two kilometers of a tourist attraction. It is directly associated with a tourist attraction or relies on tourists. Uh, we propose that it is within two kilometers of a tourist attraction, the ones that were outlined in the previous map, and it does rely on tourists. And we have some uh, numbers that, that we were able to, to get from their uh, customer loyalty program and uh, show the extent of the draw, which I, quite frankly, was surprised at how far the draw is for, for this, uh, this retailer. And I would also say that I would not expect this type of draw to be present for other uh, uh, regular retailers uh, within Peel Region or anywhere else. It's, it's, it's a much further draw than what I have seen in the past for other retailers. So the, there's the criteria which we, we have shown that it, uh, it meets. Uh, here's a sample flyer. Um, so reasons for application. Uh, one of the reasons is that um, in previous studies, as well as this one, we have examined uh, the amount of uh, spending within Peel Region compared to uh, the City of Toronto. And even though uh, Peel Region um, has a lot of tourists uh, or overseas or people from uh, outside of Canada visiting, especially with the airport uh, here, the share of spending is much lower in relation to the number of visitors. So um, applications such as this promote and enhance tourism because there will be more opportunity for people, uh, visitors to Peel Region to, to shop within Peel Region. This is a map of the uh, customers of PAT Food Market. And the way we were able to do this is they have a, a loyalty program which has over 10,000 um, uh, members and we were able to use it doesn't have the addresses for all of them but it has the phone numbers so we were able to based on the area code and the first three digits of the phone number uh, determine what community uh, they were from so we mapped them all the majority are of course within the GTA and within Peel region but this is the extent of the customers from um, beyond Peel region because the map is scaled out and you can see there is there's a uh, significant uh, draw from beyond Peel region and uh, the reason which I which I would say for that draw is that uh, PAT oriental food market is the only Korean cultural hub uh, between the GTA and all of southwestern Ontario so it draws in customers from all of southwestern Ontario from Buffalo from Detroit and beyond and uh, the the area codes and phone numbers uh, have, sh have shown that and th that has been mapped and on a holiday uh, we expect that draw to continue and people are willing to drive further and go further uh, if they have a day off than they can during a regular work day so we expect the draw on a holiday to be further than it is on a, on a regular working day uh, here it's zoomed in a little more that that thick bar to toronto is in in toronto you you can't um, differentiate where they're from other than that 416 area code so that's just the center of 416 but you can see the there is a significant draw from Toronto um, from different parts of Peel region and from the entire greater Toronto area but here again in the zoom in you can see how far the draw extends um, to southwestern Ontario which intuitively is what you would expect if you're the only one that offers these types of uh, goods and services um, it's the split of sales is roughly 50 50 between uh, weekends and weekdays um, there are several tourist attractions located within two kilometers of PAT Orange Hill food market several parks um, and in addition uh, 
PAT Food Market will uh, offer uh, several uh, themed events uh, for the holiday um, if they were to be allowed to be open on those holidays. Here's some details of tourism activities and we also expect um, that there will be crossover based on work we've done in the past between customers of PAT Oriental Food Market and other businesses in the area that are open on holidays such as uh, Square One. So the impacts of the exemption, uh, one would be to uh, retain uh, spending of customers and tourists within Peel region. If uh, uh, the holiday exemption is granted, it would increase traffic and visits to Mississauga and crossover uh, traffic to other uh, tourist uh, destinations and other uh, tourism activities, such as Square One, that would be open uh, on holidays. It would also uh, extend the draw into Peel region because people that live further away would be more likely to drive further to visit this, this uh, uh, supermarket uh, than um, on weekdays. So this promotes uh, tours to the area. Um, it would maintain the common pause principle. Um, we have, uh, our PAT Oriental Food Market has surveyed all of their employees and uh, the vast, vast majority are in favor of it. Some of them want it in order to get extra hours. Uh, they, they also uh, like the idea of uh, getting a um, um, higher pay for working on holidays as is uh, required under the, uh, the employment legislation. And uh, no, no one uh, has come forward to oppose this, uh, uh, according to my, what Jay has told me this, this morning and the signage has been up uh, for a month. Um, and of course, under the Employment Standards Act, it is 100% optional for any employee to work on the holiday. Uh, they, they have the absolute right not to work on it and uh, with, with no uh, recriminations whatsoever under the act. And they do get paid uh, a higher pay for working on a holiday. So it's entirely optional and that has been uh, communicated to the employees. And approximately on a holiday, there'd be about um, a few dozen employees working uh, at the PAT Oriental Food Market. So that's it and I uh, thank you. And uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity for listening to me. Uh, thank you very much for your submission, and I do have a list of councillors that may be asking some questions. Councillor Palashi. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm over here. Thanks. Nice. How many, uh, I didn't catch it, how many employees does PAT employ? No. Uh, well, we have um, close to 50 in, in total. 50 employees, okay. Um, how do we, and you had indicated that it's 100% uh, it's uh, up to the employee that if they choose to work on that day, how do you, um, how do you guarantee that, you, you know, I know you said you're a manager, but if you have other managers that um, there won't be repercussions if somebody doesn't want to work? Um, well, we basically, I guess, we, we put it in writing uh, as well as we ver I've verbally uh, told them that there is no reper I mean there's it's totally your choice mm -hmm. um, and they're all aware of that and um, most of the actually yeah like uh, I've never heard any of the employees say that they don't want to work like um, they, they actually prefer to work because they want to get the extra extra pay so the majority of your employees now are asking you for for this extra time um, to work during these holidays um, they didn't specifically ask me for it but mm -hmm. they did um, they, they had they, they seem to be willing to just hey I wanted to, yeah that's great you know mm -hmm. there was um, uh, a form that was asked where every employee was asked if they were in favor of it and if they are in favor of it they can sign it mm -hmm. and that sign up form was completed by all the employees there was no objections and there was there was no. none no and, no. and your retention was 50 per, 50 employees was 100 percent yes okay so, um and, and one if i may mm -hmm. it's uh it's not really a, a choice as to whether or not uh the employees uh, have the right to, to work on holidays or not, it's, it's the actual uh, legislation. Under the uh, Employment Standards Act, mm -hmm. employees are they have the absolute right not to work on a holiday, yep. and uh, there, there's, no, there's no alternative, and there can be no retribution. It says that in the Act. Yep. Um, that 2.7 million domestic, that's per year? 
Two point seven. Cus the customer's attendance is two point seven Where million. You, which slide are you referring to? Then? I don't know which. Um, it was the one with two point seven. This million? one. Yeah. Okay. That's the person visits uh, to within the region of Peel domestic, according to the um, uh, the Ministry of Tourism, of Ontario. But that's people that visit Peel region, not just the supermarket. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so, what's your uh, what's your customer base then? Do you do you any um, idea? Oh, as like an like a actual number of how many customers? Uh, yeah, how many customers do you get per day oh. per year, week? Do you Could typically a store of this size would it would be in the probably uh, the, the hundreds of thousands per annum? So maybe a few a thousand to a few thousand per day, roughly. A few thousand per day. Okay. Yeah. Um, Ten thousand members on your it was a loyalty program or um, points program or yes, that's uh, points cards. So basically, they would have to come to the store and uh, apply for points, mm -hmm. and we record their or we input the. Um, the, their phone number, and um, if we have time, we'll put in the actual address and postal sure. codes. When Most of them did not have an address, so we, we used the phone numbers and yep. the area codes. Yep. When did you start that program? Uh, we started it uh, a while, oh gosh, um, 19, can't say a specific day, but... 20 years ago? Uh, yeah. Approximately. We, start, we had it for quite a while. Okay. Um, how long and how long have you been in business? Uh, since 1984. Wow. Um, the expansion that you're currently undertaking, um, how much money are you putting into the, into the building on the expansion? Um, there's quite a bit. Um, just to give you an idea. We have to get uh, things approved, mm -hmm. and even um, even the the public, um, for example, like our front. Um, what do you like? The way how we're supposed to lay things out, and and what one of those uh, costs was uh, two hundred thousand dollars to get approval for it. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's quite a bit. And, yeah. So you're going through currently the city of Mississauga to undertake all of those construction, all that construction, and yes, and okay, yes, it might be easier if you come to Brampton. <laughs> um, <laughs> I. I <laughs> No, I just uh, I, I think this this is uh, this is unreal. The 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 numbers that you guys um, have your the base is 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 unbelievable um, for a Korean supermarket to um, to operate and and to pull in people from you know the U.S. and across Canada and overseas is is remarkable. And I just wanted to commend you on that. And that's, Thank you. That's uh, basically all my questions. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Raz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think some of my questions had to do with holiday pay as well. They were they were answered. Um, do you think it's a little bit of a little bit of spin to suggest that it's a cultural hub, quite frankly? And um, I, I think you're pushing the envelope. So my preference would be that uh, if there's a bylaw that comes in the future, you, it waits until then. Um, it, to suggest that you're the only Korean supermarket in the you know immediate vicinity. We know there's Galleria and. Oakville, Thornhill, York Mills, so it's a uh, it's a bit of a stretch for me. So I'm I'm not going to be supporting this. Just wanted to let you know. Thanks, Councillor Sato. Thank you. Um, can I ask a question of staff, Mr. Chairman? Yes, that's appropriate. Okay, thank you. It will be a question um, through you then to to staff, because this is a request for um, uh, related to tourism. If the city of Mississauga declared a certain district or a certain radius area as um, a very specifically named tourism district or tourism area, uh, Councillor Nico was talking about clusters, if that was done at the city level, would this then be treated differently as being within the two kilometres if it fell within it? It's quite possible with the nature of the establishments within that cluster or tourist area, if that does meet the tourist criteria laid out by the provincial criteria, it could, well, it could apply. Okay. So perhaps then that's something that uh, through our tourism board that we should be looking at that, you know, if we, um, uh, you know, Toronto has Chinatown and 
those stores do fall under the tourism because they are, on, are in a designated named tourist district. And we have not done that in the city of Mississauga, but we are really increasing our tourism and we're expanding our tourism to become more cultural tourism as well. So um, that, that might be something that we should be taking back um, at the city and looking at uh, Councillor Yanika, and then this application might be reviewed in a different light as it's processed through. I think we still need to go through the process. Today's just the first meeting. But when would the final or next report come back after this public meeting? I'm hoping to make it to the May 25th uh, meeting of okay. Council. Okay. So per perhaps then I would suggest, uh, Councillor Unica, we talk about that from a tourism perspective. We deal, see what we can deal with at the city and uh, prior to the report coming back. Thank you. Councillor Unica. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate that comment, Councillor Sato, because um, like so many councillors, we're aware of the machinations locally and what is happening, and you're speaking to where I'm headed because we're already going there. Because of Dundas Connects, all of the activity that is happening along the Dundas Corridor, us trying to transform it away from the highway for cars that it was by that, I mean, not just the vehicles that go by, it's the hub where you get mufflers, brakes, things of that sort. Folks like this are the ones that are transforming it within, and this is why they qualify within the two kilometer radius of the Mississauga Chinese Center. Unfortunately, Mr. Lee is a very humble man. His father is more humble, uh, but as a guy that started as a grocery clerk and now owns this and several other properties along the corridor that they're too humble to speak to, they've got plans to transform this and animate much of the corridor. This is why they're moving in this direction. So they've acquired more than this. This is why they're investing in this as residents that have been ward residents for 40 years in my constituency. So, so I know the bigger picture of where they're headed, but that having been said, under the criteria today, within two kilometers of the Mississauga Chinese Center, we're saying we qualify. If anybody has concerns, you better go look at the other ones that we've approved. And that'll come up maybe during debate when we deal with it. So in answer to the question, and I think staff's clarified it, and this is my last point, they qualify under that, but I'm looking at the bigger picture that you're talking about, and maybe in a, a fuller debate when it comes to decide, I'll be more at liberty to speak to that and why I'm so supportive. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, thank you. That ends my question here, so I, I'd, uh, I really appreciate your submission here. Um, is there any other person present who wishes to make an oral submission with respect to the subject application? Uh, seeing none then. Uh, at the time of the, the public meeting agenda was distributed to Council, we had received no written submission with respect to the subject application. I request all persons wishing to make a written submission to present a copy of their letter to the regional clerk before leaving this meeting. Are there any additional written submissions to be presented at this time? Seeing none then, I, I'd like to uh, thank all of our speakers for their interest and representations during this meeting. Um, this concludes the public meeting for the purpose of receiving public presentations and written submissions regarding the application for exemption for the PAT or Yandle Food Market in the City of Mississauga. The regional bylaw will be presented to a future regional council meeting for determination with respect to the subject application. I hereby declare this public meeting officially closed. Moving right along then, I'd like to uh, call to order the uh, Regional Municipality Appeal Council meeting for Thursday, April the 13th, 2017. Roll call. Uh, all members are present. Are there any declarations of conflict of interest? Seeing none then, uh, approval of the minutes for the March 30th, 2017 Regional Council meeting. Moved by Ken, or Mayor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Starr. Any submissions or omissions? All in favour? <coughs> Carried. Thank you. Approval of the agenda. Uh, moved by Councillor Yanika, seconded by Councillor Groves. All in favour? Approval of the agenda. Carried. I, I just wanted to announce that uh, I know the Hanlon Feeder Main Advisory Group was to meet after this council meeting. 
Um, I thought maybe it'd be more appropriate because I don't think it's going to be that long of a meeting if we could meet during lunch. Okay, well, well, just to suggest, I think I think we can deal with it fairly quickly. Um, the other the other note I want to make is uh, after enterprise programs and services that we um, move into camera bef uh, before other business uh, because there is a pressing matter with respect to uh, a um, expropriation matter. So I'd just like to amend the agenda to move into camera immediately after that, and then we'll come back into to deal with uh, other business. All those in favor then? Carry. Uh, first delegation then is Christine Seveny, Executive Director Khaled and Meals on Wheels regarding the National March for Meals campaign. Welcome. Chairman Dale and members of Regional Council, thank you very much for this opportunity to be here today and share with you uh, the efforts made by Caledon Meals on Wheels and other Meals on Wheels organizations in the Peel region. This past month was designated as March for Meals, which meant that Meals on Wheels organizations across North America uh, reached out to their communities to build awareness and support for the programs and services that we provide. Our goal throughout the month of March was to engage our community in understanding that seniors, people with disabilities, and people with life-limiting illnesses can, with just a little bit of extra help, live a happy and independent life at home and where they want to be. We know that adequate nutrition is necessary for health, functionality, the ability to remain independent. Healthy eating can increase mental alertness, resistance to illness and disease, improve energy levels, improve uh, immune system strength, enhance recuperation speed, and increase a person's ability to manage chronic health problems. Meals on Wheels ensures seniors, people with disabilities, and people suffering from illnesses have access to adequate nutrition, even when their family support or their own mobility and or their personal resources are lacking. Current trends show that seniors are living longer and longer at home, family si sizes are decreasing, and family members are living further from their parents and grandparents. These factors increase the risk of social isolation and loneliness. Recent studies have shown that isolation and loneliness is detrimental to someone's health as much as actually obesity and smoking. Caledon Meals on Wheels delivers not only nutritious meals, but provides friendly visits and safety checks to seniors. When a Meals on Wheels volunteer arrives with a meal, a kind smile, and a time to chat, it may be the only person that the senior will speak to that day. Our clients tell us that this visit is often the reason they get up in the morning, the reason they get dressed, and it is something that they look forward to, and something that brightens their day. With aging, there are increased risks of medical emergencies, falls, and other accidents. Safety checks provided by our volunteers and staff help reduce trips to the hospital, helps prevent people from moving prematurely into nursing homes. And our staff and volunteers are often the first ones to identify someone's mental and physical health and when it's in decline, or may find somebody in a medical crisis who has fallen or at times may have passed away. We are often the ones that have to call the emergency services or have to call families, their caregivers, to let them know about these types of situations. We are there to provide our clients, their caregivers, and their families that, uh, with the peace of mind and knowing that there's someone keeping an eye on them. Calendar Meals on Wheels does not only provide meal deliveries, safety checks, and friendly visits, but also bring additional services to those older adults and seniors who can still venture out from their homes and their apartments. We go to gathering places such as seniors' apartment buildings, community centers, and churches to provide weekly programs throughout Caledon and Brampton. These programs provide opportunities to bring together old and new friends so that they have an opportunity to socialize with each other over a nice meal, a holiday celebration, participate in an exercise program geared for the aging body, or partake in health and wellness workshops or recreational activities. We know that Meals on Wheels programs and services provide seniors and people with disabilities reduced visits to the emergency room, admission to hospital, but most importantly we know that these programs and services help people live independently with dignity and with a higher quality of life. 
We are so proud to say that each year, CMO provides important and in many cases essential supports to older adults, seniors, people with disabilities, and people suffering from illnesses in our community so that they can enable them to live independent, independently with dignity. Our recent service surveys reported that um, the majority of our clients enjoy and find our meals good, that they felt cared about um, as a result of the service. Our friendly visits and safety checks overwhelmingly show that people feel a sense of safety and security and they reported feeling less lonely. And our health and wellness programs that are offered in the community, people have said that it has changed their health for the better and that they feel cared about and supported and that they have made new or maintained existing friendships because of these programs. These are great accomplishments. We know that we are making a significant impact in the lives of so many people in our community, but these successes are only possible because of the dedication and passion of our volunteers and our staff, staff our leadership of our board of directors, the commitment and trust of our funders and donors and friends, and ultimately because of the inspiration and love that we get from our clients and our community. So at this time, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Region Appeal for your part in supporting Caledon Meals on Wheels. We are fortunate to have the Region's support in so many ways. The Vera Davis Centre Long-Term Care Home is our primary supplier of hot meals in Caledon, and for the last 33 years has been the home of our administrative office. Many of your Peel Living Buildings throughout Caledon and Brampton are some of the places that we host our weekly seniors health and wellness programs. And for the past four years, we've been fortunate to receive the CIP Sustainability and Organizationally Effectiveness Grants. So thank you so much for being an important and essential partner with Caledon Meals on Wheels and assisting us in making a significant impact in the lives of our community. And thank you to Regional Council for your time and interest today. And special thanks to Caledon's Mayor Thompson and members of Regional Council Joanna Downey, Jennifer Innes, Annette Groves, and Barb Shaughnessy for your continued support support in our endeavors. Thank you. Well, thank you. If you just stay in place, I know some members have some comments. Sure. Councillor Groves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Christine, for coming and presenting um, and talking about the, the, the work that you do at Meals on Wheels. Um, I think it's important to recognize how important good nutrition is for our seniors because if that's not happening, they end up in emergency, in the emergency department, and it leads to a whole lot of other um, health issues. So thank you for the job that you do. Now I, I've been volu I volunteered with Meals on Wheels for about nine years, and and you hit the nail right on the head. When you get there, sometimes we're the only person visiting that senior for that day, um, and it makes a huge difference. I know we were just there, the mayor and I, and um, Councillor Mezzapelli, We were just there going and delivering some meals a couple of weeks ago and it's great the seniors are happy to see um, to see the, the 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 volunteers that come in and your organization you've had volunteers for many 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 years which says a lot about the organization and certainly the partnership with the davis center has been great this is what makes this program work and and again pooling those resources having that synergy um, is what makes that program I'm so successful so thank you for doing what you're doing uh, please keep up the good work and certainly I know that you will always have our support in in Caledon and I'm sure all the other municipalities who have meals on wheels um, they experience the same things that we experience when we're out there and I know you have your fundraiser there is a fundraiser this afternoon is that correct we have our launch, the launch. so we have a major fundraiser which is we're selling tickets for a truck lottery mm -hmm. and so we have our launch this afternoon yeah and I guess the one important thing that I, I just want to mention is the partnerships is what makes this program work. Funding is always limited, but certainly the partnership and to the Caledon community and Bob Fines from Fines Ford, he's always been there. So um, thank you again, and um, I'll probably see you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Thompson. Thank you. And uh, Christine. Can you put that picture up for you? <laughs> yeah. There we go. We'll put it back up. Oh, there you go. <laughs> well, what I'm, first of all, I'm going to say, Christine, is congratulations. Uh, leading this organization for three years of excellence accreditation. Thank that, you. That is a tribute to you, and I think that's a job well done. Going out, uh, especially uh, we've, you know, with different managers, you know, of Husky and and people in the aggregate industry and financial industry and whatever, getting out to see what you do 
makes them say, well, we, you know, there's maybe more of what we can do. Uh, they were very appreciative of being able to do the ride-alongs to see what goes. So I think that is uh, really key at what you do. Keep up doing that because it, the response and the feedback was huge. And uh, I, I think you need to, I think it's good to do that exercise, that awareness every March. And I know my fellow colleagues have been doing it with their, uh, their organizations in Mississauga and Brampton as well. But I think it's very important to do. But the one thing I wanted to follow up with is uh, maybe expand a little bit. I know Councillor Groves talked about your truck, but you're also getting camp gear from Canadian Tire and a few others that are, this is a pretty good p package. And I do know there's tickets available. So if anybody <laughs> wants a ticket, I think I can source those for you. <laughs> so maybe expand a little bit of that. Sure. Please. So our truck lottery uh, not only is a Ford 150 truck, it's a 2017. We're calling it our Wheels for Beals lottery. And uh, it's really kind of in recognition of Canada's 150th birthday uh, so that we can uh, help people not only with the truck, but also loaded with camping equipment and two bicycles be able to take advantage of, uh, you know, um, our beautiful country. So... Thank you. <laughs> the question is, can you get the tickets online? No, we can't do tickets online, but all you have to do is call us and we'll set you up. And uh, I think I can help through, and I'll gladly help through the office as well. <laughs> That's yeah. right. So, I'll, uh, I, uh, Councillor Starr says, send me an email. So, <laughs> done. So, if, uh, everybody Thank can, you. I'll, I'll send something out on that, but keep up the good work. Thank, thank you, you so much. Well, that ends my list, Christine, but I want to thank you for being here today, and certainly on behalf of Regional Council, we want to thank you for all the good work that uh, you do in providing a, what I consider an essential service to the, uh, the community, and, and certainly uh, on behalf of Regional Council as well, extend our thanks to all the volunteers that assist in your program to make it a much better place for the residents of Peel. Thank well, thank you. you very much, and thank you to the region for all your support. We can't, uh, organizations like ours can't do it without, uh, without your support. So thank you. Um, motion to receive, moved by Mayor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Groves. All in favour? Carried. Thank you. Our next delegate is Helena West, Legislative Specialist, Legislative Services, and Amy Gill, Coordinator Organizational Development, providing a demonstration of the online lobby registry training. And I also wanted to note that uh, Mr. Swayze is in the audience as well. As you know, he's our integrity commission. Good morning, Chair Dale and members of council. I'm Helena West and I'm accompanied today with Amy Gale. Uh, she assisted in the development of the online registry uh, training module. As you will recall, at the March 9th Regional Council meeting, Council requested that the training module be presented in this form. Um, as you indicated, Robert Swayze is in the audience and he will be pleased to answer any questions that you might have regarding lobby registry questions. Um, the lobby registry training takes approximately 10 minutes and there are five true or false questions, so feel, please feel free to partake in answering those questions. Welcome to this course on lobbyist registry. A lobby registry is where lobbyists register their lobbying activity. The region of Peel has an online tool to record these registrations. By the end of this course, you'll be able to answer the following questions. What is the purpose of the lobbyist registry? What are the steps to registering as a lobbyist? How do I search the lobbyist registry? What are my responsibilities as a public office holder? What is the definition of a lobbyist? Lobbying is not a bad thing. It is a legitimate activity within our governmental structure and is a manner in which a variety of viewpoints can be brought forward and considered within the municipal decision-making process. Communicating with those who are lobbying is not considered misconduct. Lobbying is any communication with a public office holder by an individual who is paid or represents a business or financial interest with the goal of trying to influence any legislative action including but not limited to the development, introduction, passage, defeat, amendment or repeal of a bylaw, motion or resolution, development, approval, amendment, application or termination of a regional policy, program, directive, guideline or 
outcome of a decision on any matter before council, a committee of council, or a councillor or staff member acting under delegated authority. And this is the definition of a public office holder as defined in our uh, lobby registry system bylaw. What is a lobbyist? There are three types of lobbyist. Consultant lobbyists are paid lobbyists who lobby on behalf of a client, another person, partnership or organisation. If the consultant communicates for a meeting between a council member or regional employee and a third party, this is considered lobbying. In-house lobbyist is a person who is an employee, partner, sole proprietor and who lobbies on behalf of their own employer, business or organisation. Voluntary unpaid lobbyist is a person who lobbies without payment on behalf of a person, business or other organisation for the benefit of the interests of the person, business or other organisation. The lobbyist registry process will not apply to certain organisations. They are Government or public sector Officials and employees of the region, the city of Brampton, the city of Mississauga, the town of Caledon and other municipal bodies. Members, directors, officers, employees or consultants of publicly funded school boards and educational institutions. Peel District School Board. Dufferin Peel Catholic District School Board. Ontario French Public School Board. Ontario French Catholic School Board and universities, colleges and other publicly funded educational institutions. Members, directors, officers, employees or consultants of publicly funded healthcare institutions. For example, Brampton Civic Hospital, Peel Memorial Centre for Integrated Health and Wellness, Credit Valley Hospital. Members, directors, officers, employees or consultants of the municipal associations Association of Municipalities of Ontario, Federation of Canadian Municipalities. A lobby registry is an online tool available for public viewing where lobbyists register their lobbying activity. All lobbyists must register. Registration may be completed before lobbying takes place. Registration must be completed within five business days of lobbying commencing. Registration is a three-step process. Step 1. Create a profile on the Region of Peel's lobby registry. Step 2. Registration of subject matter. A registration item must be created for each issue or topic being lobbied. This will involve defining the issue or topic, identifying who will be lobbied, council members by name, staff by position, and when lobbying will begin and end. Here's a list of the categories and uh, it deals basically with our uh, regional appeal um, sorry, uh, services. Step 3. Registration is current for a one-year period. If a staff member's title appears often in the lobbyist registry, there will be no negative impact or consequences for the staff member. The registry is about transparency and accountability to the public. You deal with members of the public and or stakeholders on a regular basis. Some of your day-to-day -day interactions may not be considered lobbying as they may be part routine public process. Given below are examples to help you determine if you are being lobbied. Each instance of lobbying will depend on the individual circumstances. When do you know you've been lobbied? I'm being lobbied. Here are some examples of being lobbied. A developer bypasses the regular development process and seeks approval from the director to expedite a secondary plan. A vendor invites staff to a meeting where the vendor promotes their software solution over a solution currently being used at the region. A developer meets with council members and or a manager in finance to discuss reducing the development charge rates. I'm not being lobbied. Here are some examples of not being lobbied.
communication that is a matter of public record or occurs during a meeting of council or a committee of council. Communication restricted to compliments and complaints about a service or program. Communication with designated employees that is part of a bid proposal as permitted in the procurement policy. If you feel you are being lobbied, remind the lobbyist that lobbying activity must be registered in the lobbyist registry within five days of the communication. Check the lobbyist registry to ensure that the lobbyist has registered him or herself, the subject matter, and identified you as being lobbied. If you have concerns that lobbying activity has not been registered, send an email to zzg-regionalclerk at peelregion.ca. Your email will be forwarded to the lobbyist registrar. If a lobbyist has been prohibited from lobbying, you must stop lobbying-related communication with them and inform the lobbyist registrar. The lobbyist registrar is responsible for managing and enforcing the registry. If a lobbyist is found violating the requirements of the lobbyist registry bylaw, the lobbyist registrar may impose certain penalties. First contravention. A lobbyist is banned from communicating public office holders for one month. Second contravention. A lobbyist is banned from communication with public office holders for three months and third or subsequent contravention. The lobbyist registrar shall determine an appropriate sanction. Here's a first question. A communication between a developer and a council member where the developer asks for special consideration or particular support of an application by a council member is not considered lobbying. Do I have any takers for false? That's correct. Second question. A vendor approaches a designated employee to influence the scope of a project prior to the issue of the competitive procurement. This is considered lobbying activity. True? That's correct. Communication to a member of council by a con constituent or an individual on behalf of a constituent to get general information on public policy issue may not be considered as lobbying. Go true. <laughs> there's, there's no buzzer or gong if you get the wrong answer. <laughs> Communication that occurs during a public process, such as a public meeting, hearing, consultation, open house or media event, or sponsored by the region or a public office holder or related to an application is considered as lobbying. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. A local business owner meets with a regional council member to request potential changes to the bins being used for waste management in support of the bins that the local business owner manufactures. This is considered lobbying. True. <laughs> From the website given below. The reason for that um, being uh, true is that we already have our bins, so he's trying to propose something new that we're not using currently. 99%. <laughs> From the website given below, you'll be able to access the lobbyist registry. This is the registry homepage. The sign in is for lobbyists to access their secure site. The search is for the public and employees to be able to search the registry. To view a demonstration of how to use the registry, click here. The online lobbyist registry tool was developed to record lobbyist activity. On the left hand side of the home page are quick links where users can log in, view the registry and return to the Region of Peel homepage. The View Registry tab at the top displays a list of lobbyist profiles. You can use the scroll to find the profile. You can also use the search bar function by entering a lobbyist name or company name. 
In this example, type Jackie and press enter. Now, to return to the full list, click refresh. The FAQ tab provides a link to frequently asked questions. Click the Contact Us tab for general inquiries, complaints or other requests. Thank you for watching this quick demonstration on how to use the lobbyist registry. For general inquiries, or if you require information in an alternate format, please contact the Office of the Regional Clerk. To file a complaint or request an investigation, please contact the Lobby Registrar. Congratulations, you've completed this course and should now be able to answer the following questions. What is the purpose of the lobbyist registry? What are the steps to registering as a lobbyist? How do I search the lobbyist registry? What are my responsibilities as a public office holder? What is the definition of a lobbyist? Great, thank you. That's the training. Thank you, ladies. Don't go away. Uh, Councillor Tovey. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the, the lovely video. The um, yeah, I had a few questions. Actually, I, I talked to uh, I talked to the integrity commissioner a little bit about this, so I have a few questions. Uh, the first one is in relation to the area municipalities. So my understanding of the way this works is that if a developer has an application in Mississauga not a regional application just because of the the fact that it's there's water and wastewater involved in that application then um, <clears throat> then that uh, developer would be uh, obligated to register whether they're talking to us here or whether uh, or even about a matter that's that's coming here or or uh, you know in Brampton Caledon Mississauga those people would uh, obviously have to register with the uh, lo uh, the lobbyist register would that be correct I'm gonna defer this to Robert yeah Swayze. I've got a couple more questions as well thanks <coughs> hello mr. Swayze Good yes to see uh, you. Uh, thank you um, uh, through you mr. chairman uh, to councillor Tovey um, the, I guess to start off, um, just about every development application has a regional component. Mm -hmm. So yep. you have a you have a problem. I mean, there may be some isolated committee of adjustment application or something like that that uh, has no regional component. But I, I think you're at risk if uh, uh, if you're dealing with someone and they're not registered. Yeah, I would agree with that, absolutely. So thank you for, for that clarification. Um, the, the other thing is, you know, I have like 38% of all the infill development, 24% of the development in the city, so I'm going to have a pretty big list, a very robust list, if we will, um, which is fine. I, I have no objection to that. But one of the challenges that I think I'm having in my own brain on, on the list is that um, I have so many people in my ward that are building their own house, so they're just building a house and they're always coming to me and they want me to help them get through the process they a they don't understand the process or they'll have a roadblock with somebody so uh, in in my the way my brain works I would think that they're coming into my office and they're saying can you help speed up our process for us I would say they are lobbying for that for for that little house and, and uh, that's fine because really that's a service that uh, all of us do is to, is to try and help our residents through, through these processes. So uh, how would the lobby registry treat something like that? In my mind, they, they, they should be registered as lobbyists, but I just wanted to know what your, what your thoughts would be on that. I would have to uh, very carefully review the uh, lobbyist bylaw, which I've uh, read once or twice. Um, but I, I have, I believe, now Ms. West can probably answer it better than I can, but I believe that that person would be exempted. I'm not certain, but uh, I believe the, the lobbyist bylaw exempts somebody, uh, one of your constituents coming and talking to you about an isolated thing like that. They're still doing a development. They're still trying to get me to speed it up for them. Sure. Uh, that's true. That's pretty much exactly what the big boys are doing, so it doesn't really... In my mind, there really isn't any difference. So, comments, please? Yes, through the chair to Councillor Toby. Um, there are some gray areas. However, if the, um, the uh, resident is in a public process, they've got their applications with the building department, they've hit a roadblock there, they're in a public process, then I would think that they would be exempt from, from lobbying. 
So would that then tend to be the same as somebody say they're building a, you know, a twenty-story condo and and they're they're just getting jammed up in the process and they want they want help to get it, then they wouldn't be lobbying. If they if they have applications with the city of Mississauga or the region of Peel, I still would think that they would be exempt. We'd have to look at the specifics of the uh, you know of the lobbying. Um, so we say if you're not sure, then come to the regional clerk, myself, and if we're not sure, then we'll go through Robert Swayze and we'll get an answer to you. don't seem to be too sure. <laughs> to there are some no, gray areas. Just, nothing is, nothing yeah, is black and white. Gray, and, that's, and that's sort of my point exactly, you know, um, is that there, I think the, those things would, would sort of need to be ironed out because I'm sure every one of us has exactly that. You know, someone comes in, whether they're big or small, I've got an application, uh, can you help me get through this? Very good, Mr. Chairman. Um, one of the factors is that it's very easy to, to register and it doesn't doesn't cost you anything. Mm -hmm. So, um, out of an abundance of caution, uh, you should probably say to that person, "Please register," mm -hmm. regardless of who they are. No, no. I mean, if there's if there's no regional component, then of course they. No, I mean yes, a regional. A, if if, the, if they're even if someone's building a new house, they're getting water and sewage, right? So it's there. There's always a. In most cases, there's a regional component. That's a bit of a stretch, uh, <laughs> the connection to a sewer, you know, for an existing lot. Yeah. Well, I just like to know what the rules are. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Palashi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. As you know, we have this in Brampton, and I asked the same questions there that I'm going to ask here. Um, <clears throat> let's say I have a homeowner in, in my area that is in, uh, um, in support of a development near his or her house that's going to, that has the potential to increase the value of their house. And they're coming to me to, in support of whatever it, it is. Um, do they have to register in the, under the lobbyist registry? I would say no, but I'm going to defer that to our lobbyist registrar. Um, I would think that there probably was a public process for that, uh, maybe a public meeting. Um, again. I'm looking at the, uh, the bylaw, and uh, strictly speaking, yes. They do have to. They do. They do. It's unbelievable. Uh, okay, so let's say now I have um, a farmer in the area. I think I know what the answer is. I have a few farmers that uh, are involved with uh, with uh, Heritage Heights, and they're, they currently sit on the, on the committee, um, the advisory committee to Heritage Heights. Um, they're not developers. They're farmers. Uh, but it definitely has the potential for the development of Heritage Heights to increase the value of their property they too have to if they want to talk to me about their their land they have to register under the lobbyist registry if there's if, if they're looking for uh, regional support uh, yes if they need regional support if there's some you know, some item that uh, that they require yes mm -hmm. so okay I'll go back to my first question if a if a homeowner is is has a, a vacant piece of property next to their next to their land and and they want the city or they want the I have to make this a regional they want something next to them that has a regional component that has the potential to increase their value of their house they have to register yes I think. I, I don't know about anybody else, but I think we need to relook at that that specific that has the potential to make from my uh, from from my understanding of the city of Brampton they didn't need to register and now here at the region they do need to register the, the city of the Brampton does not have a, uh, a lobbyist registry yes, Only, we do. I'm sorry. I was thinking yes, we do. You, you, it does, and I, I was you, the lobbyist yeah, registrar that's right. until, until last week. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. true. How you forget so Oh, much. yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> well, I'm moving on. <laughs> um, I, I, Mr. Chairman, maybe uh, I should come back to Council with a, a recommendation uh, to, to solve this problem with a, with a clause that uh, we can insert in the bylaw. 
I just don't. I really don't. I agree with you. Man. I agree with you 100%. And, and you agreed and to, with me in Brampton when I asked you the question. Yeah. Well. Okay. <laughs> so I, I, I strongly recommend that uh, that Mr. Swayze does come back and 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 touch on those points. I, it's it's it could be a serious issue that anybody that in my area wants a, a member of the community, my constituents, mm -hmm. want. They have to register before they they come talk to me. No, I, I would agree with you, Councillor. That's and, ridiculous. And, uh, it is. We'll give direction to have Mr. Swayze come back. Okay. And, and I might say, Mr. Chairman, too, that I mean, if if with the existing bylaw, if you if somebody came to me with a complaint about one of those activities, I would not obviously do anything about it. No, I understand that, but it's still a complaint, and and that's the whole thing about the registry. The registry. I don't want anybody to ever think, and neither do you, that the registry is a bad thing. It's it's not a bad thing, but it has the potential to be a bad thing because if there's a complaint, a complaint is a black mark and, yes. and you know, it's frowned upon. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you. Councillor Sato. Thank you. My questions were answered, but I just want, I guess time will tell whether spending $30,000 has uh, was a good use of, uh, of taxpayers' money or not. But. Could I just ask, since we spent $30,000 on developing the system, that we make it mobile friendly? You cannot read the lobby registry on an iPad. Um, and I, I, I can't believe that we spent $25,000 on a system that is not uh, current. No, I don't want to spend more money, but if we spent the 30000 it said there will be no future costs to fixing things. So let's fix it so that you can read it on an iPad. That's the actual registry itself is not readable. Doesn't fit. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll take that as direction, Councillor. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Sprovieri. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, ladies, for the presentation. Uh, I have a question. Um, um, in a situation where uh, a member of council should meet with a builder or developer or a business person in this, uh, that uh, has an interest in developing or setting up business and uh, is, not is not registered as a lobby, but the council does meet with that person and somebody happens to see uh, the uh, people meeting and reports it, uh, to to the integrity commissioner or to the to the region or whoever. Um, so what are the, what are the consequences of that? I uh, I believe the bylaw um, uh, provides that uh, you can tell the lobbyist to go and get registered, and you have and he has five he or she has five days to do that. So you're not contravening the uh, the bylaw by talking to him initially. He has to register within five days. So if somebody sees you and you told them to get registered, you're uh, off the hook. Okay. So if, let's say, for uh, inadvertently, the, that doesn't happen. I don't. I don't ask uh, him to go and register her, and so it's reported. So what are the consequences of that? Uh, well, if there's if there's a complaint about this person, then um, I would consider it, and uh, um, it, it it certainly wouldn't be uh, um, any action against you, but it would would be against the lobbyist. So he would get a uh, penalty by for one month. He couldn't meet with anyone or two. Whatever, months. whatever. It's in my discretion. Whatever I decide. Right. Okay. So so basically, it's to the interest of the lobbyist. To register, not really yes. uh, any of uh, for us yes. here on the table. Yes, that's correct, and it's a very simple process, and it doesn't cost anything. So it's it's right. it's really a matter of notice to the public. That's what the lobbyist registry is all about: who's lobbying whom. And um, and and I, I I have had meetings with developers uh, ever since we enacted our in Brampton uh, on developments that they're proposing in their city and. Uh, so whether they register or not, what does it, what matters uh, really? How does why does it matter whether um, that they met with me and we talked about their development proposals and 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 it's and whether he's is registered or not? What really what what is what may, what's the difference? I suppose if somebody is on the other side of the issue, um, they're entitled to know who you're talking to. Okay, and um, so. Uh, 
So you're meaning it uh, if I happen to be uh, in line with uh, what that developer is asking for, then the public thinks that I've been compromised in some way? Is that, is that the idea? I don't think it's a question of being compromised. You have an obligation to talk to all these developers and, and make your judgment because you're the, you're the one who makes the decision. Right. And so the, but again, if the people, the residents don't like the decision I'm, ma I'm making, the position I'm taking, um, which happens a lot, you know, it happens to a lot of people. You got the NIMVY people that don't want nothing uh, to change and they don't want nothing uh, in their neighborhoods. And uh, so now they look at me as, because I met with this developer, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, partial, uh, partial to that developer. So. That's going to put a, a, bla a, a dark mark on me uh, come election time? Is that, no, I, is that the if idea? They, if they ask me, I'm going to say yeah. to them that that is Councillor Sparovieri's job right. to meet with all these people. Yeah. So there's quite no question of, yeah. of uh, any culpability by you. Well, that, that usually, I, there's an application right now going on in our ward. And, Someone went through Freedom of Information to see if I had any contacts with the, not only I, but other members of council of, with this, this particular developer. And they went, they wanted to have all the emails, they wanted to have uh, any, uh, to see whether there's any communication between us. So because the people don't like what this particular developer is proposing. And from what I'm understanding, uh, usually staff will uh, bring a report to see whether this, the application is supportable or not. And then uh, we have to either support the staff recommendation or, or turn it down. And if we support it, then uh, the people look at us as being uh, uh, not very, uh, you know, not looking after their interests, basically. But if you didn't talk to the developer, you wouldn't be doing your job. And there's no yeah. question that they can't have emails. I mean, it's just a question of notice to the yeah. public who are you talking to. That's all. Uh, I, I really, okay. I, and I get the point, but really, I. I, I, you know, I don't see a lot of ben uh, benefit to this at all, you know, at the end of the day. But anyway, thanks very much, uh, uh, ladies, and uh, thank Always. you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Councilor Raz. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Chair, uh, and uh, thank you to Helena, who has done some uh, work on this. I just want to say, for those of us that have been dealing with different types of lobbyist registries over the course of the years, whether it's the Ontario government, uh, the federal government, or I know the City of Toronto has had it for, for quite some time, this is the course of doing business for many of these folks, and we just have to get them into a habit of registering. This is not onerous. There is no cost to them. It's not a big deal. This is moving towards more open and transparent government so we shouldn't make it a big deal uh, and, it, and it's not and if you do have questions then the you know staff are here to help and there may be a few growing pains but we uh, but nothing that I don't believe is insurmountable so we'll work through it um, but this is a good thing to have and uh, and I would encourage you to use it and the, uh, err on the side of caution ask the people that you meet with to register there's no penalties for registering and not lobbying so um, I would just encourage people to use it, use it frequently, and um, uh, maybe you can put it in your newsletters. I'll help write an article um, to send out to your, uh, uh, your, your residents and your, the people that you deal with on, on how to use the system. So I'm, I'm happy to help any way I can, but this is a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Toby. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm very supportive of this. I just, I just I always like to look at things and go, where are the holes? Are there any holes? What are the red flags? That kind of stuff. Um, one thing we haven't touched on is, so let's just uh, set up a scenario. So this is also with staff. So let's say somebody on staff or a member of council um, gets caught you know, going, having meetings with somebody who's already banned on the lobby list. So what is the what is the penalty on the other side? I understand what happens to the lobbyists, but what happens to anybody on our staff or anybody on council who who just kind of ignores that somebody has been you know is has been banned on the lobby list? Then what happens? Well, I I, I think that um, it's required of me to to notify all members of council who is who is banned, and uh, so you would be you would know about that. 
Um, I have no jurisdiction to, uh, I don't believe, to uh, remove any of your salary or recommend its removal, um, except under the code of conduct. Um, exactly. I'd have to look at that. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be, it'd be, yeah. You can just send me an email on it, Bob. That's great. No, it's, it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm in favor of it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, that concludes my list. Thank you very much, ladies. Uh, a motion by Councillor Grove, seconded by Councillor Palashi for receipt of the deputation. All in favour? Opposed, if any? Carried. Thank you. Uh, moves us to uh, items related to public works. Uh, Councillor Starr, if you'd be kind enough to chair this section. Please. Okay, the first item is uh, 6.1, the Engineering Services, um, Regional Road 136. Reports in front of you. Any questions or comments? Moved by May. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Councillor Shaughnessy. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Chair. Um, appreciate it. Uh, this is this is really great for this uh, village in the northwest part of Caledon. I had a couple of questions for staff, and just some thoughts. Is there anybody here that I could ask? Yeah. Perfect. Great, thank you. Uh, does Anderson have a heritage <coughs> expert on staff? Sorry, I'm just trying to find, because Gary's supposed to be here in case you go into detail, but if we can, I can get the answers for you. So you, uh, you can get back to me. Yeah, sure. That would be fine. Okay, so I just wanted to confirm, because uh, Alton is uh, going through an HCD, and um, I'm just looking to make sure that they have the expertise having to do with having a heritage expert. So that would be of concern. The other thing in these small communities, they're very active. And Alton Village Association is very active, very environmentally um, conscious. Yeah. Um, so I'm just, I know when we did the one for Bell Fountain, we did a walk around. And I'm hoping that, I, I don't, I've heard great things about this company, but I'm hoping that they would engage my community from a walk around perspective because sometimes what's on drawings isn't actually what's on the ground. Uh, through you, um, Mr. Chair, absolutely. I've heard good things about how the Bell Fountain kind of extra communication worked. And so we could look at using some of those same successful methods for this project as well. Great, that would be great. And also, because of that HCD, um, I'm, I'm assuming, but I, I hate to assume, but I'm assuming that uh, Caledon's expert, Sally Drummond, who's head of our heritage, would be part of and commenting on and be in communication with back and forth, just so we don't have a disconnect. Yeah, we're working very closely with Caledon staff, and we can make sure that happens as well if it isn't already in place. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. just needed some clarification from my residents. Thank you. Hey, Councillor Shaughnessy, will we move that? I'd be happy to. And seconded by Councillor Anus. All in favor? Those opposed? Carried. The next item, 6.2, is Regional Road 14, Councillor oh, Council Groves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just wanted to thank staff for bringing this report forward. I think this is a long time coming. I know a lot of my residents have been inquiring about that road widening, um, and it is a major um, goods movement um, piece of infrastructure. So thank you. And I was just wondering, is it possible for me to get just an, uh, an electronic version so I can put it out in my newsletter or even just on my social media page for the residents? Yeah, we'll give you some um, mobile friendly key messages that you can put out. That would be great. And would there be any sort of public information meetings on this or no? Certainly, if there's none scheduled and you feel it's very important for the community, we'd be happy to host something with ward councillors. Yeah, you know what, if we can talk after because I think it would be great just to have, because there are a lot of questions from the community and how it all ties into the 427 extension and everything else in that area, yeah. so that would be great. Sure. Thank you. Councillor Sprovieri. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, uh, just, uh, and I'm really glad to see this report, Janet. Uh, it's, um, as uh, I agree with uh, Nat, it's a long time coming. Uh, the only uh, uh, point I'd like to raise is that, um, and I've noticed in the last, since I've been on council, uh, it's uh, these schedules uh, that the staff are projecting, uh, they're very rarely ever met. And, um, 
and I give you lots of examples. Uh, so, but this is such an important part of the city to be really on top of the matter, and uh, hopefully um, you can really stay on top for your staff. Tell them to to make sure that this this timeline is is, is achieved. Uh, because uh, it, the, it, the work should have been already done by already now. It's it's so overburdened the area, uh, Mayfield, especially um, uh, between Airport Road and uh, Highway 50 is where all the trucks come and then uh, to Airport Road and they head south and, and uh, that's really the part that's really overburdened uh, with trucking, uh, not so much uh, further west of uh, Airport. So um, I, I, I'd like to ask you to have your staff really on top of this and try to achieve these timelines because uh, uh, it's really important for the whole area. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Cons or uh, Mayor Thompson. Well, like what my two uh, counterparts have just said, um, and to me is as I'm, I'll gladly help move the report forward. But what I'm just saying is, if you go to 6.27, is your map. I think that'd be very helpful. The only thing I would add, add to the legend is what is uh, four lane and six lane. And I want to congratulate staff seeing that because the timelines have been held back that we need to go to six lanes versus building four and then six uh, with the cost analysis. That's good common sense planning. So thank you for taking the initiative to see that. And, uh, I, you know, uh, I think to echo what Councillor Groves and Councillor Sprovieri have said, this is long overdue, but we're finally here. Hooray. But I, I think that map, even if you put that in the papers with that explaining, I think that would answer a lot of questions for the public because I know there's been a lot of meetings in the past, but I know as Councillor Groh said, a lot of people forget as time goes on. But I really think this would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Sprovieri, will you move that? Certainly. And seconded by Councillor Groves. All in favor? Those opposed? Carried. Uh, the next item is the York uh, Peel Water and Waste Water Servicing Information. Yeah, move that. Questions moved by Councillor Sprovieri, seconded by Councillor Medeiros. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Groves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, again, I just want to commend staff for bringing this report forward. Great report, and, and certainly the council of the day and the staff of the day who came up with this model and, 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 and this, they were brilliant. Um, I, I see a lot of numbers in there. I see a lot of cost savings. And one of the things I guess that resonated with me is the cost saving to the, um, the homeowners on their water bills. So this, I think, is brilliant. Um, and I'm happy to support it and move it, and move it Mr. Chair. Um, I just have one question. I saw a whole bunch of numbers in there with respect to um, capital cost and that from York Region and that. But do we know what the um, return that we get in revenues from this agreement? Um, through the chair. So based on the principles that council approved when we started this whole process, it was all about this should not cost uh, Peel uh, ratepayers any extra money. So everything in is uh, making sure they cover full cost. Um, it isn't set up to make money okay. per se. Um, we are reviewing it because after five years we've learned things and things change, but we will follow that council principle of making sure it's full cost recovery. Cost recovery and just to save Peel money. Okay, great. Thank you. Councillor Toby. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, just in regards to that, um, you know, one part in the report where you said we've made uh, $100 million, so we're not making money, $100 million? Because it says in the report we were... Through the chair, that's how much they've paid us to cover their costs. It's not a revenue generator. I'm looking to our CFO who was part of the original... Yeah, could you explain that to me? So we're selling them water, but we're not making money? So we are, uh, it's the agreement that, as it was originally structured, was to be cost neutral. So what we do benefit, though, is by having supplying water to York Region, we get economy of scale in our system that benefits our residents. Okay. But there is not a profit margin or uh, an excess charge to 
generate extra revenue for our oh, residents, okay. but we give it to now the economy of scale. Okay, so that was one piece. And, um, <clears throat> but that, um, the, la the last report I saw actually was a York Region report, and uh, they were projecting that they were going to be actually getting a lot more water from us over the, from like now until up to roughly 2050, that they were going to be even more dependent on us for water. Um, so wh how is that trending? for us? Like, have we done an analysis of how much their water they're going to want for us up to like the 2041 growth? Ah, uh... oh, there's the guy. Andrew can answer this. Andrew can answer it. <clears throat> so, okay, through you, Mr. Chair. Through every year of the agreement has an, a maximum allowable water taking. Right. So on every given day, they're allowed a maximum amount. They're allowed to uh, that we they don't take from us, sorry, we deliver to them. Mm -hmm. After we get to that point on a calendar day, our system will shut off. Oh. We'll stop running it to them. In this year, so 2017, that maximum is 189.91 million litres per day. That goes up slightly every year, caps out 2031 at 331. After that, it flatlines. Sorry, what was it? To, to, what is it currently again? 189 and change. 189. It's going to go to three. 331. Wow. Okay. So it's it's going to increase considerably, but incrementally. Correct. Correct. From now until 2031. That's great. And how are we on the on the capacity on the wastewater side? Like, what are we doing with them currently, as far as leaders coming in, and uh, yeah. what are, what are the projections for that? Jeanette has this one handy. You're hitting at my so, wastewater hole. Um, yeah, uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So in terms of wastewater, right now, it's about 5% of the sewage treated is okay. from York. So it's a small amount. Mm -hmm. And what's that uh, trending like over the next five the same time frame, say 2031, what do we it, look at? It will trend up over time um, just because of growth. I don't have exactly. those numbers, but it right. is a lot less than the water. Good. Yeah, because it all comes down to my to my ward, as you know. So, um, okay, that's good. No, it's a terrific report, and it's a great business to be in. And as usual, the water and wastewater people do a fantastic job. Thank you. Yeah, it was uh, moved by Councilor Grove, seconded by Councilor Tovey. All in favor? Carried. Uh, the uh, amendment to the Consolidated Water Bylaw. Questions, comments? Moved by Councilor Rass, seconded by Councilor Pileschi. All in favor? Carried. Uh, the report of the Waste Management Advisory Committee. Moved by Councillor Pileschi, seconded by Councillor Sato. Is that okay? Yes, no. Councillor Rass, then. All in favor? Carried. Okay, communications. Um, the first one, 7.1. We need some direction on that. Councillor Groves? Um. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, I actually have a resolution prepared, and if the clerk could probably could bring it up on screen, that would be great. Excuse and me. this will give direction. Okay. Thank you. Mayor Thompson is going to be seconding. So what we're really talking about is the allocation of five thousand dollars. Yes, Mr. Chair. Do we have any questions or comments on the motion? <laughs> Seeing none, it's moved by Councillor Groves and seconded by uh, Mayor Thompson. All in favor? All in favor? I'm going to do a Frank Dale or a count. All in favor? <laughs> Carried. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. That have some fun here. 7.2, communication from uh, the Minister of Transportation. We need receipt on this. Um, any questions, comments? Moved by Mayor Crombie, seconded by Councillor McFadden. All in favor? Carried. Correspond or 
Uh, I guess that's it. I think, unless there was something additional. Okay, nothing additional. Back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, items related to health. Uh, Councillor Moore, if you'd chair this section, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of committee, there is uh, one report. It's a responding to the increased opioid-related overdoses. It's an information report. Are there any questions on that? Moved Move by Councillor McFadden. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. And there is one item of communication from Sylvia Jones, MPP Dufferin Caledon. It's here for a receipt. Receipt. Moved by Councillor Miles. All those in favor? I'm sorry, Councillor Toby. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, I've noticed uh, in the letter Sylvia Jones is now the uh, infrastructure critic for the Conservatives. Um, and I was wondering if uh, we could just take this as direction to invite her to uh, one of our government, uh, our government relations meetings so that we can find out what they, what they may be thinking about offering the region appeal in the, over the term of the next, if they happen to be elected. It'd be nice to get their, uh, her take on it. She's a local girl, and I think it would be great to hear what she has to say about how the Conservatives feel about uh, supporting the region appeal. Oh, absolutely. So if we could so just take that as direction. I see every commissioner shaking their head in agreement. So, <laughs> so that's a good. So they'll, it's passed they'll fight amongst themselves who's yeah. going to take stewardship okay, of you. it. Thank you. Uh, it's been moved uh, for receipt by Councillor Miles. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Uh, that moves us to items related to human services. Uh, Council Medeiros, if you chair this section, please. Thank you, Chair Dale. Um, members of Council, you have before you um, item 10.1. Are there any questions or comments regarding the award of request for proposal social housing apartment retrofit program? No. Can I get a mover moved by Councillor Fonseca, seconded by Councillor Downey? All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Uh, item 2.2. Uh, award for request for proposal social housing improvement retrofit program for SHIP for I'm information. Okay. okay, moved by Councillor Miles, seconded by uh, Mayor Crombie. All in favor? Carried. And lastly, item 10.3 questions or comments? Councillor Kovac. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just wanted to comment on this as Peel Youth Village is in the area that I represent. Uh, I can only speak highly of the very high level of services that are provided. I would love to see another four-year extension offered. I don't think that is what staff is recommending. They're recommending uh, only a one-year extension. Uh, I guess my question would be, and I think we're waiting at this time for the homelessness system review recommendations to come forward. When what, might we see those recommendations at the earliest time? Through the chair, we anticipate returning to regional council on September 28th with the recommendations related to that work. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kovac. Uh, so, Councillor Kovac, uh, will you for will you uh, put forward the motion? <laughs> Seconded by Councillor Bahodi. All in favor? Carried. Back to you, for, uh, Chair Dale. Thank you. Um, items related to enterprise programs and services. Uh, Councillor Fonseca, if you'd be kind enough to chair this section, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, item 11.1 .1 is the final 2017 final levy bylaw and tax policy decisions. Councillor Rass. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I'm wondering, can can I get a, a report or if there's information available from staff on the history of the um, uh, the vacant rebate and reduction programs? I know you're coming back to council in, in July, but I'd just like some history on that to explore. Through the chair, we can certainly bring that forward when we right. bring back uh, the report in July. Okay, appreciate it. Thanks. I will move the report. So moved by Councillor Ross, seconded by Councillor Starr. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Thank you. Item 11.2 is the 2016 Operating Financial Triannual Performance Report, and this is year-end unaudited. Seeing no questions, moved by Mayor Thompson, seconded by Mayor Jeffrey. All in favor? Oh, Councillor Ross. But you can't on the board. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Question to staff on page 11.2-10. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to. There were uh, higher than budgeted demand for taxi trips in uh, accessible transportation. Um, but there were, where am I looking? There was, um, there were fewer trips taken. 
uh, let me, where is it? Under the service delivery results for transportation, providing accessible transportation, the number of trips provided was 16,000 less from target to actual, yet we were um, in deficit for the higher than budgeted demand for taxi trips. Do, are the two related? Uh, through um, uh, you, Mr. Chair. So yes, we use a mix of services. And sometimes we use taxis because it's one person. Uh, we use the buses when we're, there's a route where we can pick up a number. So we're a demand-driven service, so it does depend on the demand. I think um, one of our enhancements we're making this year is having better business intelligence so we can look at the mix and we can be a little more nimble during the year to adjust that mix in line with our budget. Okay. So yes, they are related. Okay, there is, I just wanted to make sure on that. That was my only question, Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ross. So moved by Mayor Thompson, seconded by Mayor Jeffrey. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried, thank you. 11.3 is the 2016 capital performance and impact on capital reserves and reserve funds for information. Not seeing anyone on the board. <laughs> Moved by Councillor Sato, seconded by Councillor Moore. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. I gave you some extra time there just in case. 11.4. Uh, uh, budget policy and reserve management policy update. This is also for information. Seeing no questions, moved by Councillor Starr, seconded by Mayor Thompson. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Uh, item 11.5 is the Prudent Investor Standard Report. Moved by Councillor Miles, seconded by Councillor Mahoney. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Thank you. 11.6 uh, is the 2016 annual report. This is for information on Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario. Moved by Councillor McFadden, seconded by Councillor Pileshi. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Item 11.7 is the update on an, the environmental review tribunal, tribunal proceeding for tribunal proceedings for information. Moved by Councillor Innes, seconded by Mayor Thompson. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Thank you. 11.8 is for information report a costs associated with the implementation of the lobby. Move it. Moved by Councillor Gibson, seconded by Councillor Kovac. All in favor? Any opposed? Any opposed? Yeah. <laughs> Carried. <laughs> Item 11.9 is response to Bill 68. This is a report. Moved by Mayor Crombie. Seconded by Councillor Groves. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Item 11.10 is the report of the Legal Council Selection Committee. These are the minutes. Moved by Mayor Jeffrey. Councillor Miles. I know I raised this at the time we had the discussion. Um, can you advise as to projected costs or per hourly rate by um, this particular legal firm? Patrick. Uh, the, the projected costs haven't changed from the initial report on this matter, which was a range. Um, and I'm trying to recollect because I don't have that particular report in front of me, but I would say order of magnitude $350,000 for budgeting purposes. Uh, some members of council felt that was a little bit conservative, but uh, that, that remains our rough estimate. And um, Mr. D'Agostino's hourly rate, if you'll hold on a moment. The 
Thank, Thank you. Further. Okay. Okay. Any further questions? Councilor Miles, you're still on the board? No. Okay, so moved by Mayor Jeffrey, seconded by Councilor Parrish. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, carried. Thank you. Item 12.1 is correspondence from Commissioner of Planning Edward Sajeki, City of Mississauga with regards to the Municipal Comprehensive Review of Employment Lands. Moved by Mayor Crombie, seconded by Councilor Carlson. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Uh, item 12, oops, 12.2 is correspondence with regards to Infrastructure Accountability, MPP Sylvia Jones, who, as Councilor Tovey mentioned, is the critic. He's not here, I was gonna ask him to move it. Moved by Mayor Thompson, seconded by Councilor Innes. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. 12.3 is correspondence from Robert Semp, Police Services Board External Funding Assistance. Moved by Councillor McFadden, seconded by Councillor Mahoney. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Item 12.4 is correspondence from Karen Morden, City of Mississauga, with regards to Bill 68, the City of Mississauga Resolution. Moved by Bear Crombie, seconded by... Councillor Yanika, all in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Item 12.5 is AMO communications with regards to Bill 68. Moved by Councillor Starr, seconded by Councillor Mahoney, all in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Thank you. Item 12.6 is the Peel Police Services Board press release with regards to openness and transparency. Moved by Councillor McFadden, seconded by Mayor Jeffrey. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Thank you. Um, item 13.1 is a summary note with regards to the Aggregate Resources Sorry, Act. Sorry, that's other business. Your, your, oh, your agenda is done. <laughs> <laughs> other business You're done. <laughs> Back to you, Mr. Jair. Sorry, I was on a roll. <laughs> you, were, you were on a roll. Um, actually, at this time, I'd ask that somebody um, put a motion forward to move us into camera. Moved by Councilor Madero, seconded by Councilor Sato. Um, all those in favor? Opposed, if any? Carried. Ask that the room be cleared, please.